All right, so uh, thank you for coming. I'm going to talk about uh, making Debian excellent in Google's cloud platform. So first, uh, I'm, going to try, so I'm going to go over the goals of the session to tell you what we're doing with Debian. Uh, so, so that it's not not everybody in Debian knows uh, what Google's been doing with the compute, Google Compute Engine and uh, and and Debian. So, you know, give you the backstory of where it's been over the last uh, year or so, year and a half actually. Um, give you uh, some of the open issues we've been working on. Um, some of, share some of the things that have been going well. Some of the things that have been going a little less well. Um, to discuss some of the ideas that you might have or that others have proposed uh, on how to solve the the issues we're currently struggling with, and we'd love to get more of you involved in packaging the Google software for uh, for Debian properly, and uh, also get get you involved in building our images. Uh, so. I, our marketing people would like me to use a lot more of their slide deck than I'm going to because this is DevConf and this is not a marketing focused uh, audience so I'm not going to do a lot of marketing slides. I took one slide from the marketing deck and one nice picture at the end. Um, so this is the Google Cloud Platform. It's a whole bunch of services you can use on demand. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to point out briefly that they run the gamut from infrastructure as a service, um, so running a VM in the cloud, all the way to App Engine, which is a sort of very managed platform pl platform as a service where you just give us your code and, and we deploy it for you. Um, and a, a lot of other services in between from storing files to uh, database queries of different types. So this is about Compute Engine, which is running a virtual machine in the cloud, renting on demand. Um, so we very prominently uh, use Debian as uh, one of our major operating systems on Compute Engine. I have a couple of slides here from, with screenshots from our website. This one is our operating systems page. Yeah, it's cropped, but this is still the top of the operating systems list. There's other ones below it. Um, and many of our uh, documentation examples. I did not click on a tab on this document. Uh, this is how to use one of our features, a startup script feature. And if you go to the page, the first thing it tells you is how to do it on Debian. So it's definitely majorly featured. And I heard a stat from one of my colleagues earlier this conference uh, that maybe about 85% of our users are possibly larger are using a Debian on Compute Engine. Um, so we, we build virtual machine images for Debian similarly to how you would do it for uh, KVM or Am uh, Amazon EC2 or Windows Azure, etc. Um, we use a tool that uh, is on GitHub. We are not upstream. Uh, some folks in the Debian community are upstream of this tool called Bootstrap VZ. So a bit of history here. They used to, originally Debian built Amazon EC2 images uh, based on a tool called EC2 Build Debian AMI, which was adapted from something called EC2 Ubuntu. Uh, we at some point, this was written in shell by the way, uh, we uh, contributed support for building Google Compute Engine images, and they renamed it uh, Build Debian Cloud. And then other people wanted to add Vagrant and Open, I forget, maybe OpenSec, also certainly Open Nebula, Azure, KVM. It's, it got uh, VirtualBox, it got uh, more multi-purpose, and they realized it doesn't scale even the most modular shell code. Bash, they, they used Bash arrays, they, did, they interleave things in a smart way, they did as good a job as they could in Bash, but it was it was reaching its limits of the language, so they rewrote it in Python. And now it is actually a pretty nice directed acyclic graph uh, uh, build tool. It has a bunch of tasks that you list a set of tasks. You can have plugins. It's good to work with. And a lot of code is shared between providers. So stuff that we do can benefit um, you know, other provider images. Stuff that they do can benefit us. It's, it's wonderful. And um, a package of this is now in new as of within the last few weeks. 
Um, it doesn't quite have all of our changes in it because we're our changes. Some of the some of the recent changes are on the development branch, and they package the the master version. But um, it's going to be in Debian soon enough. Um, shout outs are very much deserved for Anders Ingeman, who started both Build Debian Cloud and Bootstrap VZ, uh, and to Tiago Ileve, Ileve. I hope I said his name close to right. Uh, those are the two maintainers of Bootstrap VZ. Thomas Ryback uh, ported, these are all non-Googlers, uh, port ported uh, our code for Compute Engine from Build Debian Cloud to the current code base. And Marcin is uh, working on the packaging for Debian of, build, of Bootstrap PC, so they all deserve a lot of credit. Um, so what sort of image does it build? We have a KVM-based hypervisor, so it's a similar setup to what you'd have for KVM. The sort of core element is a raw disk image. We, it's called disk.raw, and it's put inside a tarball, uh, a, a gzip compressed tarball for, I guess, transmission and, and passing it along. We also use sparseness wherever possible so that all the processing is faster and the file sizes are smaller. Um, the, the, so we, we, uh, we create a sparse um, disk image and then we fill in the blocks that are needed and we put it in a sparse tarball. Uh, so the hardware that's involved, it's, it's, as I said, is KVM based. We use Vertio SCSI as our current primary disk device, uh, Vertio Net, as well as the network. Um, and it supports serial console. Notice I didn't mention any Google specific drivers. We studiously avoided that. So, you know, we didn't have to add any code to Linux. There were some patches from newer Linux that we wanted to get into easier backports for, for good support of uh, performance or specific features, but, but we didn't actually have to write a Google module, which is great. That took, that saved a lot of effort and convincing. So as I said, there are some features that didn't make it into Wheezy that are useful for Vertio SCSI and Vertio Net, because these are, these are reasonably new technologies. Um, Vertio SCSI hasn't been in the kernel for more than a few years, um, which is new by non-Google standards. Um, so for example, multi-queue networking uh, was not supported by Wheezy's copy of Vertio Net, but uh, it is in the Weezy Backports kernel, and there's major performance boost by using that. Uh, there's also been lots of improvements to the, to the SCSI driver. And, uh, and so over, overall, we have a, a version. We ship two versions of Debian, as I said a few, as I showed a few slides earlier. One version just uses stuff from Staple because it's Debian. We should offer Debian. Uh, another version includes the kernel and for performance reasons SSH from backports, uh, but it's still all from Debian as well. Um, we, uh, we ship images as best we can, at least once every stable release. This has not always happened, but usually it has. Um, Sometimes we ship images more often, which is something that uh, you know, I was discussing earlier this conference with Mika Prokop, uh, among other people. Um, the pattern of shipping one image per stable release is good for the Debian installer case because Debian installer applies updates when you do your install. So if there's been security updates since the CD was cut, you still get the fixes. In the case of a cloud image, I don't know if you really want a long update cycle before your image and maybe a reboot cycle before your image is ready to use. So um, it's nice to have. So for example, we, we pushed a new image after Heartbleed. Uh, that's a very high prominence example. Um, we also have some code that we add to the images, very much free software that uh, we've updated periodically for future reasons. Um, so what goes into the images as generated by these tools? Um, well, first of all, any questions so far? before I keep going. I don't want to keep talking at you and boring you. So are you suggesting using the backwards image and deploying teams? So the question was what we would suggest for, for use. Yeah, we generally suggest using the backwards uh, uh, image because it's, uh, it performs better. The Weezy kernel doesn't support every nuance of the hardware in the way that gives the best performance. The only caveat is um, it is simply that, of course, the backports kernel is not supported by the security team in the same way, nor the SSH pack. So there's, there's, if, if security is paramount, 
you know, then, then we see stable. But for most customers, the right trade-off, and keep in mind, if there's a security vulnerability, the fix will get into testing. It will get into backports. So we will release new images periodically. And if you apply updates anyway, you'll get the fixes even before we push out a new image. So depending on your trade-offs, yes, you, usually we recommend backports. That's what most of our customers are running, actually, is, is a backports image. Um, other questions before I keep going? OK. Um, so the, we do a pretty minimal the bootstrap install. Less is not installed much to many of our annoyances, uh, nor is the full version of the Vim package. Um, we do add some things. For example, we add the dependencies that we require for our integration code, including Python. Um, and uh, we change certain things. Uh, as in every case that I'm aware of, we ch the changes that we make have a specific uh, justification. So, for example, uh, we shorten we we uh, so our DCP server serves a host name, and that gets set on the image. There's a long uh, domain name that's based on your Google Developers Console project name, um, and with a dot Google dot internal suffix and. So it gets a bit long, and if your host name is also long, then some common software which is used in the cloud case, namely Java 7 and lower, uh, has bugs in, uh, in that situation if, if it exceeds a certain total host name length and seg faults. This was fixed in Java 8, but not Java 7 and earlier. And it's just one example. There's been other programs that have misbehaved in this type of situation. So we have a DH client exit hook that shortens it. You know, we, we, switch, we tweak a couple of specific settings in the SSH config. We try not to change much because it's, uh, you know, we don't want to stomp all over Debian's defaults. But for example, we disable password authentication because we have a key, a key based management system in place. We have, um, we disable, we set a SSH keep alive also right now because, um, uh, if there's no traffic over 10 minutes, the network drops a connection, a few things like that. And we, NTP, we do NTP sync from the host. Um, so there's a couple of open issues as far as what we want to do for configuration. One question is, Bootstrap VC supports installing the standard set of packages that is often installed in a DI installer. It's less minimal, but it would include things like less, not necessarily Vim, but less. Uh, and, uh, some other commonly used packages. Um, so we could add that. Um, but it is not the bootstrap default. It is a DI default um, for desktops. We, we could also consider automatic updates. Now, that's a more controversial topic, and I know that, um, because you know, Debian does not default to automatic updates, and that, that is, in fact, why we have not enabled it. Um, and uh, on the one hand, it simplifies the life a lot of users for keeping their fleet up to date. Um, in many cases, they won't even have to take any action because we even reboot a lot of demons when we upgrade on Debian. That's also a downside, though, because customer software may or may not be written in a robust enough way to handle reboots, but customers should be doing that on their own anyway if they're, if they're doing it in the best practices manner. So we could consider whether this should be added to the Weezy images as a, as a Using unattended upgrades, this is actually supported by Bootstrap VZ via a plugin. Um, we could consider making it the default for Jesse Cloud images, or there's a lot of uh, possible options there. But that's an open issue. Um, so we do add some software. There is no licensing obstacle. This is all Apache licensed. I think some, you know, some components may have dependencies that are under compatible licenses, like the BSD license. Uh, so we have the Google Cloud SDK. If you're running an image inside uh, Google's cloud, it's nice to be able to work with the environment that you're in. It's analogous to Yucca tools uh, in the Eucalyptus and Amazon world. Um, so access the, you know, access the API to list or delete instances or to grab objects from our storage, et cetera. And when you're running it from within Compute Engine, you can have uh, integrated authentication so that you don't have to deal with the usual OAuth flow that you require from your workstation. This is not currently in a dev package, so we, we put this in user local to respect the file system hierarchy standard. Uh, we put it in a directory under user local share Google, and we symlink into user local bin. Um, we would like to get this package, and I have more to say about that on a future slide. Um, we also have a, a GitHub repository of what's specifically integration glue for the compute engine environment. So one bit of this runs user-supplied startup scripts. 
if, if it notices that you're running on a uh, multi-queue networking uh, kernel, it'll set IRQ affinity to give you good network performance. Um, this last part is not currently working, but it, it tries on first boot to run at get updates so that when you try to install a package, it doesn't say, you know, not found. Um, it would be nice to at some point use cloud in it. There's been a variety of obstacles in place, but that's, that's, that's a work in progress sort of uh, discussion. Um, we have an account management daemon that uh, is actually a very convenient feature where if your user, if, you, if somebody has access with edit or owner rights in your Google Developer Console project, they can, SSH, they can uh, easily have an SSH key get added to the virtual machine uh, semi-automatically, and uh, then they can SSH in. It also enables a, a feature that works in our, developer, in, our, in our web interface to SSH from the browser without needing any client-side plugin. It uses JavaScript. Um, and uh, sends over public key only through the wire, not the private key, and that actually gets removed after a short amount of time because it's a specific passwordless kind of passphraseless kind of thing. Um, we have a daemon that manages the routing table a little bit to uh, enable our load balancing and routing advanced routing features. And for those who want to export their image, um, currently the best option for exporting we have is this. We have an image bundling tool that uh, copies over the partitioning information. It copies over the file system into a new disk image and gives you a tarball that could be imported directly as a new image. We also have a new feature that launched pretty recently at the API level to let you convert one of our disks into an image directly. However, there's not currently a way to export that other than this tool. Um, so we've been making some progress on packaging, including at DevConf, uh, especially for Google, Google Cloud SDK. I described how we're currently installing it into user local. Well, Thomas Guaron, Zigo, has been very helpful in uh, getting an initial package of Cloud SDK into new. He's working on getting it to use setup tools instead of, instead of a more custom method for entry points. And uh, it's really great to have that in progress. We're going to work both with him and the other Debian folks who want to be involved and, uh, um, and with the Cloud SDK team. And for the other integration stuff I mentioned, we currently build devs using an unfortunately internal method, uh, but it, it's just basically putting files into place. Um, there's really no black magic happening. Um, and we put them on an app repository that's used in the build, and they're also published as a release on GitHub. We would love to switch to proper source packaging. I am swamped. My teammates are, are new to this type of uh, specific task. Uh, also swamped, though. Uh, so getting more people involved and uh, getting them into the archive proper for as, a, as something that would be useful just to, to get install or up get upgrade. It's a reasonably easy way to help because there's nothing complicated about those packages. Just mostly putting files in place. There's a couple of, there's an init script for one of them or if, to run update.rc.d. There's nothing hard there. So I should summarize what's been going very well in, uh, in the relationship with Debian, and there's a lot. Uh, the Debian cloud team, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of helping each other. We're sharing a lot of code, sharing a lot of tips, you know, discussing what should be done in various ways on the Debian cloud mailing list. Uh, I mentioned Debcom 13 a bit later. It's that was basically a, I, I, I like to say it a cross cloud a collaboration love fest or something. You know, it was we were all attending each other's talks and being very positive, and it was a lot of progress was made. The, shout out to the kernel team and Ben Hutchings for um, being very responsive to our patch request. We've also tried to keep those reasonable and you know, in, you know to be fair to everyone. Um, for example, things like memory leak fixes and uh, perf small isolated performance tweaks, and. Uh, trying to get uh, prerequisites, uh, f trying to get drivers into Jesse before the freeze instead of, instead of you know, five months after release. So we're trying to be reasonable on that end. We, we, asked, about the, we asked about using the Debian trademark because we were calling these images Debian. They were responsive while also respecting what makes Debian Debian and not wanting, you know, we, we struck the right balance there, I think. Z Zach and Luca have both been encouraging to our efforts. You know, they both have, you know, they both have feedback about, you know, how to respect Debian's needs, which is great because it's good to have, it's good to have, uh, it's good to have people paying attention and helping. The public clouds and official Debian 
image status buff last year in Switzerland had a lot of great roundtable discussion with, uh, you know, we, were, we, we introduced a session, but it wasn't really focused on us in any specific way except by mentioning some examples. And that, that had a very useful transcript uh, written up by somebody earlier this year based on watching the video that got sent out to the Debian Cloud mailing list. Um, and certainly the Bootstrap VZ and packaging assistance has been great as well. So thank you very much to all of my Debian colleagues for being wonderful to work with. So the main challenges have been an impedance mismatch, to use an engineering bit of jargon, between uh, uh, the normal way Googlers think and operate and the normal way Debian typically thinks and operate. For example, Cloud SDK, that team has a rapid release cycle often twice a month. Debian has a enterprise release cycle often half of a release every year, <laughs> once every two years. Uh, and so Backports has been uh, very useful for providing a middle ground uh, as a way of getting some newer stuff in there. I imagine that Cloud SDK will receive some updates through Backports uh, once it is properly in Debian. Maybe we'll provide an alternative repository for those who need every single update. But um, so Debian in general likes to stay close to upstream defaults uh, for all the software it ships and doesn't like to diverge too much in different use cases in out-of-the-box configuration. And I understand that, right, because Debian needs to support the product and, uh, and uh, you know, we're all volunteers here generally or not at least paid to work on Debian specifically. And, uh, you know, we need to know what we're debugging and helping with here. And similarly, Google... Um, Google's used to building things in a context where it can control a surprisingly large portion of the stack, sometimes down to the software, sometimes down to the hardware, but it's used to building things in an integrated fashion, and uh, it's used to having uniformity within the Google context more than across you know, different distributions. And you know, everyone is actually acting in good faith, and I'm really, um, and people are trying to you know, bend in useful ways. It's just, uh, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing effort to make people, you know, see how how the other group works. It, but it's actually, it's actually going pretty well. So I say challenges. These are not obstacles, right? These are these are ongoing things to work on, and it's actually people are learning, and it's great. Uh, so you know, Debian has deep packaging experience, deep community experience. It knows the distro world really well. Googlers often come from an area of knowing their specialty extremely well, like you know, whether it's you know, kernel minutiae or security or network uh, performance considerations. And they certainly know how the commercial world works. Not all of them have been involved in the open source free software communities. But you know, everyone's collaborating surprisingly well. That's because everyone on both sides is trying. Um, so how do we move forward from where we are to where we want to be? Uh, we definitely want to get our stuff packaged, and we love help with getting our stuff packaged into Jesse and Weezy Backports. We're going to try to build off of the momentum from this conference for Cloud SDK. We would also like to get Compute Image Packages, the other integration stuff, packaged so that uh, you know, Debian could feel more comfortable with these images and call them, you know, get closer to something Debian finds official. Um, we also want Debian to own these images in the sense of, right now I've been building a lot of them, my teammates at Google have been building a lot of them, but they're Debian images and, you know, the, you know it would be great if Debian affiliated people, not just me, uh, were building and these images, you know, once, once this has worked uh, successfully for an image build two, three, four, um, we'd even say, great, you can upload directly what our customers will see promoted by Google as, as our Debian images. You know, we definitely don't need to be an intermediary long term. And uh, there was an idea mentioned this conference by Steve McIntyre of possibly having the CD building infrastructure do this. They already do the live images as well as the CD images, and they have a way of doing contained builds. We do our builds currently within GCE VMs, but that's simply for isolation and not a prerequisite. Uh, it you know, prevents our local environments from either being contaminated by a bug or interfering with the build in some way. So uh, it could also just as easily run on uh, the CD infrastructure, on, under DSA control, whatever. Um, and we should figure out what defaults make sense 
for Debian's cloud images. Sometimes those would match DEI in defaults. Uh, sometimes those might be different. I mentioned the security issue uh, and the possibility of wanting to do unintended upgrades. I mentioned that we disabled the password authentication. At one point, I was going to mention the permit root login setting, um, but Colin's decision to switch to without password as a default for, with, for the SSH config is actually a pretty good balance of security and convenience. Um, it, it, allows, it still allows, for example, a forced command uh, SSH key. The wording without password is a little bit scary to people who don't know what it means if they see you can permit root login without password. But what it really means is password is the only case in which root login is never enabled. So that's, it's, it's actually good, it's just confusingly worded, okay. Um, an issue was also raised this conference of the init RAMFS size. You may think, why is that an issue? Well, it's a 13 meg init RAMFS with the default modules equals most settings. Um, and again, why is 13 megs an issue? Well, we, we did some measurements, or my colleagues did, not me. And uh, thank you that she's right here. Um, and uh, it takes about 16 seconds of our boot up time to load the init RD. Um, and we are trying to do whatever we can to make the internet our, to make boot up time fast for, so that everyone can have the best experience possible. And uh, turns out going down to modules equals dep in the init ramfs config brings that down to 2.4 megs from 13. So we'll probably make that change for pretty good reason. Um, we also noticed that most of the remaining 2.4 megs is taken up by libc. Uh, and the only thing in the init rd that needs libc is busybox, I think. Um, maybe bash, I'm not sure, but we could try to see if we can find static libraries or relink those, but that might be a longer process. What, we don't want to be disrupt, doing disruptive changes short before Jesse, you know, but if, you know, 2.4 is a lot better than 13 anyway. So these are examples, right? So these are, these are changes that we, we, we should see what the defaults should be for the cloud environment and also, who should decide them? The release team could be involved in deciding this, but I also don't want to force work on them if, they're, if they have their hands full with the normal releases. It could be a cloud team effort to say f across different Debian cloud images, these are reasonable ways of deciding defaults. It, you know, doing the decisions by Googlers, acting under Google you know, priorities and pressures in isolation is not something that means likely to be happy with, and I know that, but it could be a way to prompt a discussion and maybe have Debian say, yes, the cloud team can use these criteria for deciding what the deviations are reasonable, something of that nature, because the answer is not always one size fits all. So places you can discuss this stuff, there's a mailing list, Debian Cloud, on Debian's normal list server. There's an IRC channel, Debian Cloud, on Debian's normal IRC server. You can email me. My Debian email address is jimmy at Debian, or that's my work address, jkaplowitz at Google. We have a Stack Overflow tag for user support. Uh, feel free to answer or ask questions there. And we have a Google group, which is also, of course, usable via email, um, where users ask questions. There's also paid options, but you know, that's, th these are the free options, and they are heavily used. You can also discuss right here, right now, any questions or comments. Eric, is there a microphone? Is there a microphone? Pass around. If there's... If there's not, I can repeat it, but... Okay, go ahead. And it's maybe slightly outside the context of your knowledge, but why has Debbie decided not to do why has Debian decided not to do it? Uh, I, I wish I knew. I, I'm going to guess that it's because nobody has decided to do it. Maybe there are other use cases that are not the cloud case where it's a bad idea. And, you know, you know does anybody know? Um, I can just speak a, a, mic. Can a mic. I would love to get you a mic. If you, if you can't get a mic, I'll, I'll rephrase or paraphrase or something. It looks like they're reassembling the mic back there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I can only speak for myself, but the last thing I want to have um, is automatic upgrades of my machines. Um, it is 
always unfortunate when all of your 100, 200 boxes um, fell out of the net because you have one box. You should stage with security upgrades. So test it on one or two boxes, and if this works, use Puppet or whatever to get it on all boxes. Sure. Okay, so... Uh, but if you do it by default on all your, let's say, Google Cloud, few thousand boxes, Right. They were all fell out of the net at once. So since there's no mic, I'm just going to summarize for the video recording. Um, so I think what you're saying is, as a as a default, doing it as a default is risky because you could one bug could cause many of your machines to fail. And if you and it, you agree that it's good to stage and test updates on a fraction of your fleet and then roll them out some via whatever mechanism you want. But doing it by default on all of them is risky. Okay. Um, yeah, and I also agree, and certainly I don't think anybody, what, you know, I don't think anybody who wants uh, unattended upgrades on by default would want it to be mandatory, uh, inclu including Google Security, who is one of the people who wants this, you know, but uh, nobody wants it to be mandatory, and certainly anyone who's using Puppet or Chef is sophisticated enough to run that, or Ansible, Salt, whatever equivalent you wish. Um, you know, they can, of course, they should be allowed to do their normal way. Um, but you were saying, Eric? No, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah. Um, the, the, the question is simply, what is a good default there? Tony? <laughs> if we get a mic around, it, it, can come, it can start floating. But until then, I'll, re I'll paraphrase. So you, you currently support two images. And uh, I guess my comment was that you could support a pure Weezy image, and then folks could enable backports if they wanted, and then support a plus image. Because I'm thinking there are a lot of users who would benefit from a slightly more configured image yeah. with with updates, possibly. Right? They need to know the risk and be able to turn them on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's annoying to not have less the first time you show it to a box. Right. Uh, so uh, the Tony's comment was that it, we couldn't consider offering multiple additional flavors of images with, or, or at least one, or, or one or two, with uh, you know additional levels of configuration and more stuff available by default. And we agree, and we're we have some thoughts along those lines. But yeah, uh, my comment was just maybe still maybe just two. Oh, he's but saying just two. And, but we see pure. And okay. If someone wants Weezy plus just backports. That's easy. Okay, so you're suggesting that we keep the Wheezy image as it is and change the backports image to have more stuff. Hello? Yeah, make that Wheezy plus. That's a possibility. Whatever we do, as long as we're calling it Debian, we want, of course, Debian, both the community and the trademark people to be comfortable with it. And, uh, and uh, you know, if we do end up wanting to do something that's especially customized for Google, we would probably discuss with Debian how to balance the two brands in a way that Debian's comfortable with. Yeah. But not not to pretend that it's regular Debian. Any other questions or comments? We have a mic now. Yay, mic! Yay! So ask more questions now that we have a mic. <laughs> we have a bit over ten minutes left. I was I was wondering, uh, is there much more need for more customized images? It seems that most people are using some ready-to-go base images and then maybe call their configuration management. But um, did you hear of, of users that they like to have a tool that does a little bit more than creating the base images without using some, yeah, b without booting up the um, the base system into the virtual instance and then calling the configuration management? So we actually, so not every user is, you know, skilled enough at systems administration to have a complex uh, configuration management system ready to go, or they don't know how to manage it, et cetera. Um, so we already offer some additional uh, customizations. There's something called Google, De Google Cloud Deployment Manager. And we have some click to deploy images that, you know, basically it effectively automates a startup script for, for some certain common cases like certain development stacks. Um, and certainly there are tweaks that might improve performance or security uh, that may be more invasive compared to Debian defaults that might be desirable in the cloud context or maybe shipping more Google tools than is reasonable to ask Debian to do by default. Uh, you know, there's a variety of use cases, but. Uh, Certainly, anyone who's 
going to be doing their own config management will want something reasonably like what we have now, yes. Other questions or comments over there? Repeat the number you used in, at the beginning about number of Debian images or percentage of users that run the image. I think the number was, Venkatesh, you can correct me, I think the number was out of the, for, you know, since for, for technical reasons we were able to get, get data on, it aggregated of course, aggregated data on roughly 96% of our images and uh, instances and roughly 85% of those were using the backports Debian. Uh, image, and the additional ones were probably using the regular Debian image. We also offer non-Debian operating systems, but I didn't put them on the slide. <laughs> okay. Other things? All right. I'm happy to talk about uh, these topics or, of course, other Debian topics uh, for the rest of the conference. I'm here till Monday. Thank you.